I'm excited to introduce today's guest. His name is John Wood. And John and I got connected on LinkedIn. He's actually a listener of the podcast. And he's a bit of an atypical guest for the show because he's not currently sitting in a selling role in a software company. That said, he's got his first role lined up. And after our conversation, I think he's got a great future ahead of him in the industry. But I wanted to bring him on the show because of his background. So John is currently in the process of transitioning from a military career into a civilian career and tech sales is in his uh, line of sight. So I brought him on the show because he has some very interesting ideas around mindset and how to achieve big, hairy goals, how to work together as a team, and how to continually improve yourself, all under the context that the guy's been through some really stressful situations and pretty much seen it all. So I wanted to bring him on so he could walk through his framework, his mindsets, uh, and his methodology for how to think like uh, a soldier in a software selling career. So with that, welcome John to the show. John, thanks for coming on the show. Jesse, great to be here, man. Awesome. Well, I wanted to start off with uh, a little bit of background about yourself. Please uh, do share your your background, your story, uh, anything you care to share to the audience, uh, share with the audience about uh, where you come from. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm still active duty military right now. I'm transitioning to an SDR role here in the next couple months. Um, got a pretty random background, so. Grew up in a very conservative family, um, attended school in college for theology, actually, which I don't think I've used at all. Nice. Um, so, but I, I had a lot of uh, super nerdy activities. Uh, it's funny, everyone I work with today is surprised to learn, like, I was actually like, one of the biggest um, activities I was a part of was speech and debate. So three years of high school, and then I started a, uh, a group in college that we traveled around and went to tournaments and stuff like that. So that was a big passion of mine. I got done with college uh, 2013, and I realized I've got a whole lot of, you know, book learning and knowledge, and I, I don't know anything about the real world. <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. yeah, yeah. Um, two weeks after I graduated, I had started training for a job in medical sales, and I was like, I don't, I don't know if I want to stay here in South Carolina. You know, I want to like experience the world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I had had a conversation back in November with a guy in Alaska, cause I had been saying I wanted to work on a commercial fishing boat. And so he called me up and he's like, Hey man, I had a deckhand quit. Do you want to come work in Alaska for the summer? And I was <laughs> nice. like, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so after yeah. like five days of training with this, with this uh, medical device company. I was like, Hey, really appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to go work in Alaska. And they're like, okay, all right. Um, so I, I flew up, I got that call on a Friday. I flew up there, I think Sunday afternoon. And I spent two months on a, a tender in Togiak, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, really that just led to like two years of working in different places. I, I, I finished the summer Flew into Denver, bought a motorcycle, traveled around, uh, worked on a worked on a cattle ranch in Colorado for a minute. Yeah. Um, traveled back to South Carolina. Uh, I got a job over the holidays loading trucks in an Amazon warehouse. And then I was out in, in uh, Colorado for the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. and I was looking around and I was like, "Man, there's a lot of oil and gas trucks out here, so I could I could do that." And so. <laughs> I had flown back to South Carolina. I looked up jobs. And at the time I was not present on LinkedIn. So I looked mm -hmm. at Craigslist. Oh, wow. Found a job on Craigslist. And they're like, yeah, you, can you start Monday? And I was like, sure. So same thing. I loaded up my car. I drove out on like a Thursday or Friday, showed up Monday morning at 8am. And I was like, Hey, I'm here. I'm ready to start. That's awesome. And they're like, great. Your interview is in two weeks and it's a temp, temp position. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that wasn't on the Craigslist posting. So <laughs> uh, I quickly learned I didn't get that job. So I had like $800 to my name and I'm stuck in Colorado. So oh, I started man. driving up and down yeah, around Denver and I found a job fair in Casper, Wyoming. Huh. And so I go, I sleep in my car in a Walmart parking lot you know, change and shave in the Starbucks. 
And then I go to the job fair. I see a guy that works for Halliburton. And I was like, okay, that's the guy. So I walk up to him. I start talking. He's like, okay, well, yeah, where are you from? I tell him I'm from South Carolina. And I drove out. I told him I drove out for, for this specific event. And he was like, wow. <laughs> so <laughs> stretch, bend the truth a little bit. But yeah. um, then he found out I had slept in my car. And he's like, you know what, man? If you can apply for the job, I'll give you an interview today. And I was like, cool. So I went back to the Starbucks, applied for the job. And I got the job with uh, Halliburton. So I worked in the oil field there uh, for about a year. And then I, I, I had always felt this calling for the military. And so I, um, I kind of got that clarity in those two years of bouncing around. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is never going to go away. I, I, I need to do it. So um, I enlisted from there, joined the military, specifically the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, and yeah, I've been doing that for the last six years. I've been in deployable positions. And then for the last about 18 months, I've been an instructor for our assessment and selection program. That's awesome. Yeah. And when did a uh, SaaS selling or tech selling kind of come onto your radar? I know that your focus as of late, um, and I'm not, I don't remember, I know we talked the other day, but I don't remember how long you've kind of had tech sales on your radar uh, but tell us how that, you know, came about and, and what drove you to, to look into the industry. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've, I've always kind of had a, a, a bent towards that. You know, I, I produced a radio show in high school um, and every job that I've had, I've, I've been the guy that, hey, this isn't working. You know, someone needs to figure it out. And so I really enjoyed playing with it, figuring it out in that capacity but I'm definitely not a programmer. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. just, I'm, I'm more of the, uh, I don't know, surface user level and explaining it to others. Yep. Um, yeah. So it really entered my radar because that two year period after college, I kind of, I did the same thing. I was like, I don't want to stay in the military forever. Like I really enjoyed this, but I'm, I'm ready for the next thing. And about a year ago, year and a half ago, I guess, you know, we deal with a ton of candidates, hundreds of candidates, right? And we have all these metrics that we have to record their mental aptitude, their physical capabilities, all these things. And it, it was all being done by hand. So you have to write it down on a piece of paper, take it to the database and then plug it in. So huh. kind of saw a need for an app to get developed. And I, I went down to a company in Tampa and I met with these developers and talked to some project managers and I was like, this is a, this is a really cool space because yeah. Yeah. of everything, of everything I've done, it's creating something mm -hmm. is the fun part, right? Yeah. Like when I was on the, my, one of my proudest achievements, I was working on the ranch in Colorado mm -hmm. and the first time that I dug a corner post for a fence, I was by myself. I dug it down, you know, packed it with rocks. It was solid. I mean, this was, it was beautiful, right? And every day I would drive by it and I'd be like, that's a, that's a really nice looking fence, you know? <laughs> <laughs> nice. A little pride in your work. I love exactly, it. Exactly. Exactly. The pride in the work. So the sales thing is kind of uh, a given based on my personality and interest. And then the SaaS space, it's just exciting. Like yeah. I, I have a problem of uh, getting bored with simplicity. Like if I have to do the same task, or deal with the same problem, address the same exact thing over and over again. It, it, it's not challenging, but if, but if I'm teaching, if I'm explaining, if I'm identifying areas where, you know, the product that I have can solve for their issues, mm -hmm. uh, that's exciting to me. That's awesome. So yeah, one of the reasons, uh, just for some, some greater context for everyone out there listening, uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to have John on the show was one, a lot of the listeners are transitioning from either another career field, you know, in your case, you're, you're transitioning from the military lifestyle to a civilian lifestyle. And then, you know, you kind of pitched me on sort of your approach to how to, you know, how to, how to manage your mindset, which is a topic that I've been studying a lot over the last probably six months, which is, you know, now that I'm starting to kind of level myself up in my career, how do I make sure that, uh, you know, I'm managing my mindset in a way that is going to set me up for future success? Because really what I've found, especially over the last probably 18 or 24 months, is where your head's at is going to determine how successful you are in this game. 
so I loved your approach and, and I think there's a ton to be learned in this industry from the, your, your, your experience in the special operations forces and part of the 75th Ranger Regiment. Uh, and so I want to kind of dive into some of that today, uh, but just wanted to set the stage for, you know, I love the fact that you're transitioning into the, the industry from, uh, you know, a military background. And I love that you already have a framework for yourself uh, in terms of how to kind of apply what you've learned so far in, you know, in the armed forces and the in services uh, to this industry, which is, you know, SaaS sales and, and how to manage your mindset and approach it, uh, you know, with, with a military-like discipline. So walk us through, uh, you, you know, you shared with me the five SOF uh, truths and so just to, to, to break that out, it's the uh, five special operations forces truths. Walk us through those. And then, uh, you know, just for the context of everyone who out there who's sitting in a selling role or trying to get into a selling role in the software space, how can we be thinking about these truths uh, and how can they be, be applicable to our careers and, and uh, success? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I finished Chris Voss's book the other day. That's a good and, one. And uh, yeah, loved it. What he said when he went to Harvard and he was dealing with the smartest people of his day and he felt like, you know, the dumb dumb in the room, um, everything that he learned was learned through real life application and testing. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I like these these five soft truths is this is not from a textbook. This is from real life. This is these are lessons learned. This is coming from the refinement of a process that's been going on for for many years. So. There's five of them, but the first one is humans are more important than hardware. Mm -hmm. And that's that kind of speaks for itself. But, you know, the best piece of equipment that you have is useless unless you have a competent individual that's going to work through the issues, that's going to utilize it to get it done. Any hardware is a tool. The person behind the tool is really what matters. Right. So so that's number one. And we can go more in depth in, on these, you know, yeah. uh, maybe after, but sure. um, second one, quality is better than quantity. You know, that's, that's why, um, you know, we have a selection process. We are, we are looking for high quality individuals because we can take, you know, a million individuals, but if they're not the right person for the job, then it's not going to get accomplished, right? It's better to have a select group, um, rather than, you know, just, you know, throw a, a whole bunch of resources at a problem. So that's number two. Mm -hmm. Number three, special operations forces cannot be mass produced because what you're looking for is specific and refined. You can't just take that and run it down your assembly line. That's interesting. G give us an example of where that applies. So give us a military example. And then I'm trying to think through some, some real world sales examples or, or tech examples, but I, I'd be curious how, you know, an application for that in, in the real world. Yeah, absolutely. So for people not familiar with the military, uh, I'll give a brief rundown on what it looks like. So you have, um, you have your reception, you have basic training, you have your skill training, and then you usually get sent to your unit, right? Mm -hmm. The military, you take this general aptitude test, and if you score in a certain range, you are assigned to certain MOSs. These are, these are the occupational specialties that you qualify for. Yeah. You can be an infantry guy, you can be you know, a refueler, you can, you can be a medic, you can be anything. Mm -hmm. And so they'll take those individuals and they'll put them through basic training. Everybody has the same haircut. Everybody wears the same clothes. Yeah. They go through the same process and everybody practices, practices their task in the exact same way, right? So it's, it's kind of a mass producing. You are learning the application of a specific task rather than how to kind of use ingenuity to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So okay. you can, you can't take that same approach to special operations forces because you're, you're facing, you know, unconventional problems. Um, now I, I don't want to come off with the perception that, you know, non-soft forces or regular army can't use ingenuity. Right. Right. I mean, there's, they're very, they're just as capable. It's just that every single, um, person in soft has been vetted for their, you know, capability to do that. 
So is, does that give a yeah. better background for that? Yeah, no, that's super helpful to, to hear like a real world, you know, in context example uh, of what that means. And I, I think a carryover would be, think about it like this. You have uh, a company like Outreach, right? And they have their processes in place and they go through their their sequence and the Agogi sequence and all that stuff. And it's going for a specific type of person that can take it and apply it, but then there's enough leeway that they can deal with specific situations, right? Yeah, yeah, you got to give a little bit versus of yeah right. versus like an SDR or, or you just hire somebody to man a call bank and to strictly read from a script with yeah. punishment for deviating from said script. Yeah, so that's exactly what came to mind when when you said you know cannot be mass produced, and, and I think that's a pretty hot topic in the industry today is. If you're mass producing something like an outreach sequence or, uh, you know, a cold call script or something like that, then it's not going to be personalized enough and it's not going to be genuine enough. And I think a lot of times our buyers buy from us because, uh, you know, we're genuine and they buy from people they like. Uh, so I'm a big believer in, you know, not mass producing things, but, but customizing things while also still following, a, a, you know, a key framework. So I think that is very applicable uh, and, you know, super interesting to see that carry over. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, number four. Yeah. Competent special operations forces cannot be created after emergencies occur. That's an um, interesting one. Yes. Uh, th this is, again, not theoretical. This was an actual thing. So there were some, some situations in the 80s where things went down and they realized that collaboration had to be practiced. Right. Specific skills had to be learned beforehand so that you're being proactive, not reactive. You can't learn those skills in the span of two weeks. They take years to develop. So because of that, it needs to be, you know, constantly, constantly developed, trained up to this point where it can be utilized at any time. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm, you know, reading through the item here, the bullet here, and just kind of thinking about how I, I would think about applying this to selling. And uh, <clears throat> the way I think about it is, so you, you got to come into everything with a plan. And one of the keys in, in especially selling strategic deals or larger enterprise deals is not waiting for there to be a firefight or a you know fire drill, if you will, mm -hmm. coming into every conversation prepared, preparing your resources, and not waiting for you know sort of post scramble uh, in in any process. And I think when you do that, you build credibility with the prospect, and you're not you know in reactive mode; you're in proactive mode. That's kind of how I read that, and would would think about applying that to you know my own selling. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this isn't uh, unique to soft. This is across the army. There's some, there are things called battle drills and a, a battle drill uh, is basically like a, a basketball play. Mm -hmm. So you practice your play and when you encounter, let's say an, a, a near ambush, right? Somebody is, you know, 20 feet away from you, they open up and start shooting. Well, you got to practice reacting immediately. And so we'll do that. We'll, we'll be, we'll practice reacting to an ambush and you turn and burn. You, you go straight to the source because the cost of inaction is everybody dies, right? Oh. So you have to practice, you know, these things perpetually because it's, it's muscle memory. Right. Interesting. So. Okay. And then uh, number five, most special operations uh, require non-soft assistance. And this is where, um, I think in sales, in the military, everywhere, you can't let your ego get in the way of that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an easy temptation to fall in. Um, you know, I've spoken with some guys about the, the AE to SDR relationship, the sales to marketing relationship, the HR, you know, everybody's working on the same team. You're going to need help from other people. So basically, you know, don't be an asshole. <laughs> I love it. So what I take away from this too, and I, I, I think I just did, if I didn't just recently do a podcast episode on this, it's definitely a topic that I've been thinking about a lot. Early on in my sales career, I was a little bit of a lone wolf seller. Uh, for whatever reason, 
I felt like there was a stigma around asking for help from, like you said, other departments. There's, there's other orgs that a, sell, a seller can ask for help from, uh, leadership. I used to, you know, be hesitant about asking my direct managers or even my skip managers or even the executives and the companies I worked for. All of those are, are resources. And, you know, it, oftentimes you require that assistance. And yeah, for whatever reason, the, you know, kind of first several years of my selling career, I didn't think that that was a good practice. In fact, I even saw other people utilizing management and I thought, gosh, they can't sell on their own. They have to have their, their direct manager sit in on every call with them. Now, I'm not advocating having your direct manager sit in on every call. At a certain point, you do need to have some autonomy and independence and, and be proactive about running your cycles. Sure. Uh, but I'm now a big believer and champion of you need to uh, peer or pair the, the right resources uh, together. So in some cases, if you're selling to executives, you need to ask for help from your executives on your team to, to peer with your prospect executives. Uh, because people want to interact with people that are at their level, uh, or at the very least have their same title. And again, I, I wasn't necessarily sold on this as a strategy early on, and even felt like it was a, a negative thing. But now I couldn't imagine doing my job without being able to ask my executives, my manager to join in, and uh, you know, sort of be a peer resource. But then even in addition to leadership, yeah, utilizing BDRs to, to help build pipeline, utilizing the marketing team for content and other resources. I, I almost always have a sales engineer uh, or a technical resource in a lot of the calls that I'm in because I want to make sure that if there's a technical persona on the call or an engineer on the call, that they have someone that they can interface with. It's not me. Uh, everybody can smell after five minutes of talking to me that I don't know that much about coding or APIs or integrations and things like that. So I want to make sure when I you know, have a deal cycle that everybody's kind of paired with a resource that uh, is someone that can be a real resource for them and a real, uh, you know, yeah, a real resource in, in their evaluation. So I think yeah. that was an especially well, important one. Well, I'm, I'm curious, Jesse, what led to the change? Was it conversations with other people? Was it a situation gone bad or? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. So probably just, certain mentors over the years that I, so specifically mentors that I've taken on in, you know, the last two years who were really great deal makers, uh, encouraged it. And I saw them doing it and I thought, okay, hold on. This is a top performing exec, uh, selling, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars or, or in some cases, millions of dollars worth of software a year. Uh, and they're using executive peering, so this is, you know, and I kind of changed my mindset. This is not a, uh, a weakness thing. This isn't because they don't know how to sell. They need to have their CEO sit in on a call or their, you know, their direct manager or VP of sales sit in on a call, uh, or, you know, they need to bring a sales engineer in for, for technical guidance. I realized that just kind of over time and watching some of the top producers achieve their results and noticing that, you know, typically besides maybe a pricing or a negotiation call, they're not really running a single call uh, one-to-one. -one. It's, you know, it's always group selling. It's always bringing in and pairing resources. So it just, the, yeah, it was kind of a gradual change. It does really help to land in a role where you have a manager that, that suggests that and reminds, uh, because I can say that early on in my career, I was probably in some roles where management was running around with, with their hair on fire. So they weren't mm -hmm. necessarily making themselves available to, to step into my calls. So it does take working for a really great sales leader who can suggest that and encourage that. Uh, and I've been really fortunate over the last, uh, you know, couple of years to have some leaders that were a hundred percent willing to either jump on a call and, and be that executive peer or, you know, go and, and lobby higher level executives in the companies I've been at to, to attend calls and then, uh, you know, also been very fortunate over the years to have some technical resources that are always willing to jump on calls. So it was kind of a gradual change. And it certainly, it also kind of happened in tandem with me going from selling smaller businesses and more mid-market type accounts up the chain to selling larger enterprises. It just starts to feel a little more natural because as you go into selling bigger ticket deals, uh, it's less about, you know, you as a seller and it's more about you as a quarterback. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to company resources and how do you sort of play the longer game and how do you think more strategically about how you do deals and that's really what it comes down to with these larger enterprise deals is how do you 
show the prospect that you can align the right resources behind their project. Whereas early in my career, I was probably closing more transactional deals and the emphasis wasn't on, you know, aligning resources and credibility and experts on the calls and executive peers and things like that. And the, the emphasis was more on getting the deal done. Uh, you know, in, in, in the very early part of my career, the emphasis was how can you get them to pull their credit card out as quickly as possible and do the deal right there on the spot. And then that kind of segued into, you know, again, more transactional deals and how to move quickly and just get something done. Um, but yeah, as I've kind of progressed in my career and moved up the, the, to the you know, more enterprise strategic type deals, it was sort of a natural progression, but I think it also came from observing a lot of uh, other great sellers who had mastered the art of being able to align organizational resources behind something and then showing that to the prospect, like, hey, look, uh, you know, we're so serious about earning your business and your partnership that we're willing to bring our senior level executives on the call if that's needed. We're, we're willing to bring our top engineers to a call so they can speak to some of the integration aspects. So yeah, gradual change. And it's, it's uncomfortable at first, but it gets easier and easier. And now it's just sort of like second nature. You know, I'm not going to go into an enterprise deal cycle without uh, thinking through what resources I'm likely going to need in the process. And again, mm -hmm. that's typically going to be someone on the technical side. That's typically going to be an executive peer that's going to be able to relate to the top level decision makers and provide that necessary influence that I can't provide because I don't have a you know VP in front of my title. Uh, so yeah, gradual change, watching other top producers use it and uh, it just gets more and more natural. And it, what it takes too is a little bit of sitting down and, and thinking through your deal cycle. So that's, I think, another change that I've seen over the last several years is early on in my career, I don't know that I thought strategically about my deals. It was always just, we, you know, I got to go get this done. So I need to go get this paper signed or I need to go get the credit card number so we can book this thing. And as I've progressed in my career and again, focus more on strategic deal making, it's more of a, okay, so here's this deal that we have, or here's this opportunity out there and, and, and we need to go win it. Who are we against? Uh, what are they going to need? What are their kind of wish list requirements? Are they, you know, who's involved in this? You know, is this, who's sponsoring the project on the executive level? Who's running point on the project kind of in the mid manager level or director level? Who's on the front lines uh, at the user level? who uh, might have some influence on what, what selection they make in terms of the right vendor. Because uh, those people are important too. They're gonna be the end users day-to-day uh, -day that are gonna be managing the you know, kind of day-to-day -day use of the, of the product. So you wanna try to get influence on every single level. So it's important to go through and you know, there's a gajillion tools out there to manage that process. LinkedIn sales nav is one of them. Um, but you know, old fashioned PowerPoint's another one where you can kind of, uh, you can, you know, kind of manage org charts and things like that. So um, yeah, tons of different ways you can do it, but uh, it's a key change in mindset for sure. Yeah, it seems like, I don't think it's specific to sales or the military, but it, it comes down to your people and processes, I think. Um, yeah. I try to use a three to one ratio. So I, I said I have a, a bachelor's in theology, but I've, I've got a master's degree in bullshitting. So <laughs> Um, I feel like you need a, a, to weigh the ratio a little bit in terms of asking those people, because you have everybody on your team, right? If yeah. all that you're doing is saying, I need you to do this relationship tends to get a little strained. So, I mean, my approach is, you know, the, the three to five minute check-in, Hey, I'm not here to, I, and I'll, I'll actually say it at, at work now. You know, I'll put my head in and say, I'm not here to ask for anything. Just want to tell you to have a great Ranger day. Yep. <laughs> and then, and then they'll laugh and then we'll talk for a minute and I'll be like, okay, I got to go. And so those times when I have to actually, I actually need something to happen in a timely manner. I could put my head in and be like, sorry to bother you. I need this like ASAP. Yeah. And it, and it usually works out. Right. Yeah. But, but the people in, and then the processes, it sounds like you've got your process down. And I think uh, that's is that's the real recipe. Instead of running around with your hair on fire, like you were talking about, some of your managers having a process where you're like, okay, yeah, I this is what I'm going to do next. I'm not going to magically just, you know, become a god mm -hmm. at dealing with this issue. But I have this training to rely on, and I have this process that I'm going to use. 
So there's no need to freak out. I'm just going to re resort to the level of my training, which is this yeah. process. Yeah. I love, by the way, that you have a theology degree. Uh, I don't really use my degree too much either. I have a degree in mass communication. Uh, but what I've found is, you know, sellers can kind of come from any sort of college discipline. Something like theology, I think, is kind of interesting because, you know, you study different worldviews. And when you're, you know, when you're selling a prospects, part of the, the process is understanding worldviews and uh, being empathetic. I think a, a topic that doesn't get talked about enough in enterprise selling. And I had a previous manager and mentor who really drove this point home. He said that the key skill, especially in selling large deals to, to large enterprises is empathy and being able to put yourself in your buyer's shoes in a real way. Uh, it doesn't get trained enough on and it doesn't get emphasized enough, especially early on. Like, I don't think I ever thought about empathy as being a key skill. Oh, I, yeah, I, I can't agree. And it's funny that we're talking about this because I had a, uh, I was talking about this with my fiance the other day and she was telling me that I'm, I'm not an empathetic person at all. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? She's like, you don't, you, but, but there's three types of empathy. It's not emotional empathy is not where it ends. There's emotional, there's cognitive empathy, and then there's somatic empathy. Some people literally feel the same pain as another person, right? And so the military teaches you to shut off your emotional empathy, but you have to have a high heightened level of cognitive empathy. You have to understand how somebody thinks, right? Because you that that's our job is to kill bad guys. Um, so I, I think the focus on empathy is important. And I think it's imp important to talk about the different types because I don't, it, it doesn't seem like it's worth your time to, you know, some stranger in the street, you're not going to devote all of your, uh, you know, emotional empathy to that person and right. then not have any to give to your, to your family or, or what have you. But, mm -hmm. but for, you know, that's something that I'm that I'm uh, striving to get better at is the emotional empathy in colleagues, you know, asking people what they're going through, trying to understand, not in a cognitive level of like, okay, yeah, I understand why you're sucking then, but like actually connecting with them on that level. So um, yeah, yeah empathy is a big word, but I, I think there, it's important to talk about how it's more than just one meaning. Yeah. And where there's, you know, kind of real actions that you can take on, on the empathy front and selling is starting by learning who you're selling to and, and what their typical day looks like. So, you know, the more you understand your buyers and what their frustrations are and what things they hate about their job, what things they love about their job, uh, what things create friction, uh, what things are awkward for them. And kind of putting yourself in their shoes. And this is, you know, this is the perfect kind of, again, practical application of empathy in the real world is start to research who your buyers are. And, you know, again, buyers might be on a number of different levels. So there might be a different answer for, you know, a VP of marketing versus a director of marketing or, or uh, you know, manager of marketing or someone on the front lines. Uh, yeah. So, there, you know, the answer might be different on each level. Uh, but I've been, you know, I've been, one of the things I've been doing lately is just trying to go through that exercise of, okay, who are my buyers? What is it that they don't like doing and how do I help them avoid that thing? And then what is it they do like doing and how do I, you know, sort of associate myself with that stuff? Uh, so if they love, uh, you know, serving their team and, because they're a people manager, what am I doing to help them achieve that goal? And so that's, you know, again, kind of the basic level uh, is just, because it's, it's kind of funny to me, especially when I look back at my early career and I didn't do a lot of research on who my buyers were. And I just arrogantly would reach out and say, uh, you know, you should buy this tool or this solution because I say so, you know, because I got a number to hit and yeah. I'm a seller at this company uh, versus, you know, reaching out saying, hey, I understand that this might be a big painful problem in your world that either keeps you up at night or at the very least causes a lot of friction or is a pain in the ass, whatever it is. And here is specifically how our product can be used to solve that big problem. Uh, I'd love to show you more coming from a place of humility. I don't know everything, but I do know that we've helped other people like you solve this same problem. That's it. But I used to reach out to people, you know, and I wasn't trying to be arrogant, but it's just interesting the way that sales reps learn uh, is I guess you kind of have to learn this on your own, which is 
the more you can, and, and this applies back to, uh, you know, things can't be mass produced, uh, you know, special forces, special operations forces cannot be mass produced. If you're just sort of going through the motions and it's not very powerful to your buyers, but if you can tailor it and again, be really genuine about it, it just makes the job so much easier and more rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You got to, uh, I was at my brother's wedding this past weekend and we were at the rehearsal dinner and everyone was giving the toast and uh, my now sister-in-law's college roommate was talking about how, oh, she, she wouldn't share with me his last name because she knew that I would look him up on social media, right? <laughs> I mean, there's nobody better than a, a college girl at finding out everything about a, a person. Right. And I think, you know, it, as, as a salesperson, like you gotta, you gotta unlock your inner college girl. You gotta <laughs> actually, you gotta find out everything about them, you know, and, yeah. and what makes them tick and who they are as a person. So, uh, yeah. I, I think that that's the difference. I, and it seems like that's what you're saying. You, you are learning about the person. You're not just finding out how they can help you. hundred percent. And it's really, you know, I think it was probably in 20. 15 or 2016 that my, my mindset really shifted from I'm trying to sell to people to I'm here to actually enable and help. And, you know, the, the quota attainment and achieving, you know, commission checks that, that I set out to achieve as a byproduct of that, not the main goal. So success in sales is a byproduct of how many people you can help, how many people you can support and how many problems you can solve. Uh, I, again, I think it was probably about 2015, 2016 that I, like, it was like a light bulb came on and I don't know if I read it in a book or what I do remember is I started applying it. I was reaching out to just tons and tons of executives at the time. Uh, I was in a, a role that was very heavy business development and a lot of cold business development. So it wasn't reaching out to warm leads who already had a project or already had some interest in, in our product. It was blind, cold outreach to people to try to sell them on getting a meeting uh, so we could show them more. And it, it was like, I woke up one day and again, I don't know exactly what triggered it, but suddenly one day I woke up and I was like, you know what, I'm going to start pinging people via LinkedIn, via email. And my message isn't going to be, can I get 15 minutes to show you our product? It's going to be, here's how we help other people like you. Is this even of interest or would this help you too? And that's it. It was less about like, can I get 15 minutes of your time? So I can do a demo for you. And it was more about, um, I think this might help. I don't know, but I think this might help you. Uh, is that a fair assumption? And if so, you know, would you be open to meeting? And, and it's, a, it's just, you know, it's, it may not sound very different, uh, but it's a huge shift from, from what I was doing before. And since then, I've kind of always subscribed to that model of prospecting and outreach, which is more help focused. And uh, there's a really great... Uh, I can't remember the name of the book, but there's a really great like dream 100. There's a book that talks about like a dream 100 list in sales uh, or a dream 1000 list. I can't remember the, the exact number, but the premise of the idea is in your industry, you should go and put together a list of a hundred or a thousand or however, you know, really whatever number you, you think you can do, uh, how many people you can influence or help in your industry. And as you do that, what's going to start happening is more doors are going to open up from that initial hundred or thousand people that you, uh, you set out to help. Um, the book's by Chet Holmes. I'm trying to remember the name of the book now. Uh, I'll post the link in the show notes, but it's, it's a really great concept that is, you know, if you want to be really successful in sales, sit down in your current space in your industry, even if you're starting out, even if you're just in your first SDR role, sit down and write out, you know, and, and it's interesting because this is a great exercise. Like who, who are the hundred people you could help in your space? Mm -hmm. You might start by looking at your account book or your region uh, or there's a number of other things you can look at who are influencers in your space that might, you know, if you help them, let other people know about you and your product. And one of the other things that I've seen that's been an outcome from this that I've, I've noticed from really top elite sales performers is they start to become a hub for their prospects. And I've been really excited. I've actually started in a very small way. I'm still working on this muscle myself. Uh, but lately I've started to have prospects give me a call out of the blue on my cell phone and say, you seem like a resourceful person. Uh, what can we do about this? And that's when you know you're starting to have an influence beyond just selling a deal or closing a deal. It's, I am now a hub or a resource to the people around me in my industry. And that can lead to referrals. It can lead to them plugging you into other opportunities. 
It can lead to expansion deals. There's just, you know, so many possibilities. So that's, you know, one thing I encourage everybody and a good way to start doing that is, you know, get on LinkedIn and start posting content. Uh, or if, if LinkedIn's not the right channel for your buyers, find out what, where your, you know, your buyers live and how can you get in front of them to start influencing them and really just, you know, take a step back and say, let me find a hundred people in my industry that I can just help with something. I don't know what that is, but what, what might I be able to help with and get creative, you know, and be personal about it. Cause everybody has some value they can add in some way. And if you reach out and lead with that, it really does snowball and you'll start to become again, kind of a hub or a resource for your prospects. And then they start calling you out of the blue saying, you know, Hey, we need this big problem solved. You seem like a resourceful, uh, you're a resource now in our minds. How can you help us do that? And that unlocks, you know, more pipeline, more leads than you could ever imagine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it kind of lines up with what you were saying about, you know, be yourself and don't pretend to have all the answers. Cause, um, it seems like the most successful people are just fully themselves. They're pursuing their passions. They're not finding out what people want to know. They're just doing something because they enjoy it. And then using that as your springboard to help others, I think is, um, it's kind of the natural way to do it. I think in the military framework, what that looks like is everybody has their strengths and weaknesses. Some guys are better at, at shooting. Some guys are better at medical training. Some guys are better at uh, demolition, right? But you find kind of your niche and everyone knows who's good at what because everything's graded. Um, and then guys will will be around you and you'll just offer to train them or you'll, you'll help them on these specific tips and tricks. And then it kind of grows from there. It can grow into an actual position just doing that. So that's the the military side, but that's exactly what's happening with you know, guys in, in the SaaS sales world as well. Um, I mean, you see it. I, I've been loving LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Just, I guess, tangent. I, not a huge fan of social media, you know, uh, Instagram, I'm on there. And, you know, I, I like all my, you know, friends and family stuff, but I don't post very much. Uh, but LinkedIn is a great community. There are some awesome, awesome people on there who want to help. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't, I don't spend too much time on Instagram or Facebook or anything else, but I am, I'm on LinkedIn a good amount of time. Uh, and it's, it's a super important tool in the toolbox for the modern seller because it gives you you know, access to your buyers, but also influencers, other people in your industry partners. I, I mean, the possibilities are really endless and I'm definitely on in the camp of, you know, or on the side of building up your LinkedIn network as best you can. And, I may be a little too, uh, you know, laissez-faire about who I connect with. <laughs> I know some people have said, well, wow, you seem to connect with everybody. Um, but I've never had, you know, never regretted it up to this point. I mean, it's always been a handy thing to have. So uh, yeah, big fan of LinkedIn and, uh, and what you can do there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to ask you about indoctrination. Tell me about, so, so one of the, the principles here in terms of onboarding new personnel uh, is indoctrination. I want to hear your thoughts on that and, and maybe how that applies to, to selling software or, you know, managing a, a team of software sellers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I think about this in the same way that, you know, I, throughout my life, if I've seen something that I want to do, I just find out what, you know, uh, the person who is successful doing that is like, and then I follow their lead. Mm -hmm. um, military indoctrination looks like you come in, you learn the history of the organization, you learn kind of the culture, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. Um, you have to learn the vocabulary. You know, there's a lot of army acronyms out there, just like there's a lot of acronyms in the SAS world. Yep. Um, but if if I'm the manager within the military and I get a new guy, I want to make sure he knows the history, where we came from. He knows where we're going. I want to tell him exactly what is okay. What's not okay. Make sure that he is understanding of the vocabulary. He knows who is who, right? He's going to see you guys walking around. I want him to know his name, uh, his position and his responsibilities. 
Then I'm going to assign mentors. So there, this comes at two levers, levels, mm -hmm. uh, at the peer level and then the supervisor level. So there's going to be a guy that's, you know, maybe six months ahead of him and he is just going to be a shadow and he's going to do everything he does. And, um, then there's going to be the supervisor role, which is going to be more of the checking in. So this is something that you need to learn how to do. So I'm going to show this to you once, and then I'm going to let you practice with your peer mentor. Because there's a huge emphasis on mastering the basics. It's special operations forces are not special because they do something crazy different. Mm -hmm. It's because there's this huge emphasis on the fundamentals. Right. And the person, the, the people who assume the leadership roles are individuals that ascended throughout the ranks and they kept going up the chain because they were still masters of the basics at no point do you ever stop practicing those things um but the biggest thing within that is i want to find out what drives an individual i want to find out their why you know so i'll i'll spend time talking to them i'll find out where they were born how they grew up what their family dynamics were what their beliefs are um if you don't understand the why, then you're not going to know how to motivate the individual. Because you could have two individuals say the exact same thing to them, and you get two very separate reactions. One guy shuts down, one guy gets fired up. Right, right. Um, so, so the indoctrination piece is, I almost think of it, it's like an inclusion into a family. It's not a... Uh, it's not a casual thing. It's like, sure. you are now part of our family. This is what you need to do um, to be a good family member. Interesting. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I really like the emphasis on mastering the basics. That, uh, that seems pretty relevant because, you know, it's easy to forget to, as, as time goes on, it's easy to get rusty on the basics, but the basics are kind of like the, the foundational building blocks for, you know, for being successful. So I like that aspect of it. And then, uh, you know, I think it's interesting that the whole concept is more around, here's the guidelines for being a good family member, you know, now that you're part of the family, not so much, we're trying to change you. Um, but we're trying to, you know, sort of shape you, uh, to, you know, to fit, to, to be aligned. So I, I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's important to do some of not, maybe not every task, but do some of these things with them because I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I, I, uh, I'll get a guy and I'll be like, what the hell, why are you having trouble with that? And then I'll try it myself and I'll be like, Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe I'm asking too much of this guy right now. Maybe I need to, you know, realign my expectations of what's acceptable, what's unacceptable. Cause it's just been so long since I've done it, you know? So that, I think that keeps you grounded and it lets them know like, Oh, okay. He's willing to do this with me. He's not just, telling me to do something and then retreating back to his high castle. So I think that we said focus on mastering the basics, but that's kind of a loose term. Right. 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 It's which I don't like, I like specific application. So mm -hmm. let me tell you, I'll, I'll give you an example of something. Yeah. Um, okay. So new private shows up very first thing that I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to say, these are things that you're going to have on your uniform, right? You're going to have your pen and paper. You're going to have your ID card. And every day I'm going to check to make sure that you have those things. So why do we do that? Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's say now we're overseas and he was supposed to bring uh, some demolition or his gun or something like that. And I say, Hey, do you have that gun or that rocket or whatever? And he says, Oh, I forgot it. So it's, it's, yeah, which yeah. sounds crazy. Like it could never happen, but you, you know, things, things happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So there's that. And then this, like the next thing that I would have them do is we have our, our medical bag and inside the medical bag is a litter. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, all right, here's what you're going to do. You're going to get the litter out. You're going to set it up because it's, it's broken. You know, it collapses down. You're going to set it up and you're going to put this blanket on top of it. And then the time's going to stop. And then 
I'm going to restart the timer as soon as you touch it again. And you're going to break that litter down, put it back in the medical bag and then pick it back up on your shoulder. Cause the bag's a, a, like a backpack. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the minimum acceptable time is one minute and 15 seconds. Okay. okay. I expect you to be under one minute. I'll tell you that my personal best is about 50, I think 51 seconds. Oh, wow. And so, right. So, yeah. but I, I say that not like to brag to them. I tell them I have done this myself. I know what's achievable and I'm willing to do it in front of you cold without having done it in months. Mm -hmm. And so then they're like, okay. And so they practice and they know it's not me saying, Hey, you got, you gotta, you gotta master the basics. No, you have to do this in this set amount of time. That's the expectation. I have done it. So I know it's possible. I will show you that I'm possible, you know, capable of doing it mm -hmm. um, so that you have more buy-in and, and trust. So I, that, I just wanted to bring it back because I don't want to get too kind of in outer yeah. space. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's good. It's good to talk about those things, but the specifics, like, um, I, I think it's pretty easily applicable to a sales role um so yeah i won't go further than that but i just wanted to bring that back i'm curious i mean as someone who's who's probably been in a lot of stressful situations and, and i know you're still pretty early in your software career um but, but i think a lot of people would agree that this is a pretty stressful industry there's there's a lot of periods where it's you know a lot of uncertainty uh there's no guarantees there's you know, a lot of risks that you have to take sometimes, especially when, when you're working on larger deals and that's, you know, representing a big part of your income for the year and things like that. How are you, you know, kind of thinking about it now and, and, and looking ahead, how are you thinking about kind of managing stress and anxiety and some of the things that might come with, uh, with this career? And, and I'm a big believer that SaaS sales really isn't a career at all. It's more of a lifestyle. And as part of that lifestyle, there's going to be periods where, there's high anxiety and high stress. How are you thinking about managing that? And, and you know, maybe what are some things you learned in, in the services that, that are applicable to everyone who might be feeling anxiety or stress in their current role? People and processes. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. Yep. So you, you need people that love you that are going to support you, that can rely on you when you're having a bad day, and then you need your processes. So my process is... Uh, the immediate process in a stressful situation centers around breathing. So your, your sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system is only paired by your breathing. So if your heart rate starts increasing, you start freaking out. You, all you need to do is just breathe. So there's something called box breathing. So you, you breathe in for four, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, and then keep the breath expelled for another four. So it looks like a box if you draw those four uh, I've yeah. never heard that. Yeah. So when you're in a super stressful situation and you don't know what to do, all you got to do, you just breathe. Huh. Okay. Okay. And then the thing is you think of your processes and you say, which process am I going to apply at this time? Which one makes the most sense? Okay. I've practiced that. I've been here before. And so I'm not going to freak out. And then if I fall flat in my face, I have people that I can rely on that are still going to be there and we can live under a bridge together and be happy. So, so in, in, in military service, like what's an example of someone who you might rely on? Is that family or is it other, you know, kind of counterparts in, in the services or, you know, tell me about that. Um, and I suppose, you know, if in, in a selling world, you can rely on your peers and colleagues and, and leadership and things like that. But I'm curious, uh, you know, who, who were some examples of people you relied on? Sure. So I'll give an example. We talked, I talked about battle drills a little bit before. Um, one of the battle drills is entering clear a bunker. So you might have a machine gun in this bunker and it's shooting at you. So the way that you take it out based on your available things, if you don't have overhead uh, support or whatever, you're going to clear it with a grenade. So you have to run up to the bunker close enough to where you can get a grenade in. And this is typically practiced at the squad level. So you'll have one team of four and another team of four. And so uh, I've, I've done this before where you'll have live rounds 
one team will set up and they'll lay down suppressive fire. The other team will then run up, sprint, and then you kind of throw yourself in the ground. And then you stand up, run, sprint, throw yourself in the ground. And so as you are running up, the other team has a machine gun and they're shooting at the bunker and it is, it's impacting pretty close in front of you. Wow. So as I move closer to the bunker, my other team, you know, controlled by the team leader, squad leader, they're actively shifting their fire a little bit more as I sprint. So I have to know that even though there's a machine gun shooting, you know, immediately in front of me, I have to know that as I stand up, and sprint into that kind of hail of gunfire, mm -hmm. my buddies are going to shift that fire so that I don't get shot. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of this protective wall that, that moves off as I get closer to the bunker. So, huh. so as far as, as trust, um, yeah, there, there's a huge level of trust because we have that relationship, but there's a process. He knows he can hold his hand up and know, okay, I have the specific amount of degrees that I need to be off him in order to be safe. And I trust him to follow his process just like he would do the same for me. Interesting. No, that's cool. Man, that's some serious team building for sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> so, so back to the breathing exercises and stuff, are there any other sort of mental tricks that, that one can teach themselves to, to manage stress or is it really come down to just managing breathing, remembering people in process, anything else that you could share? Yeah, really no, absolutely. I think you need to subject yourself to shitty situations. <laughs> so, I mean, it's easy in the army, but like, what do you do if you're in the civilian sector, right? Sure, sure. I, I think you need to take trip. You need to like go to Colorado, hike a 14er and it's, it sucks. You need to like physically feel some suffering. Um, and then when you, when you were going through that time, you can think back to that experience and be like, you know what, this sucks, but at least it doesn't suck as much as that time I was walking through the swamps in Louisiana, right. Or as much as mile 17 of that marathon I ran, uh, or, or mile 23 when I hit the wall. So, that is um, I think you need to just do hard things and kind of get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. So when you encounter a new situation, you're like, okay, well, I voluntarily put myself in that situation. This isn't that big a deal. I can, I can get through it. This is such an interesting topic because this is something that I, I guess I'm practicing, but I don't even, I didn't even realize that it was, there was any sort of methodology to it. Um, but yeah, I kind of make a habit of putting myself into uncomfortable positions physically, mentally, in some cases, so what's, uh, and what's the last, what's the last uncomfortable thing that you made yourself do or so one in memory? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So physically, I, you know, I live here in the, the Arizona desert and it's, it's hot as hell. Uh, you know, especially getting into the next couple of months, it's going to be pretty unbearable and I'm a biker. So uh, I mountain bike and yeah, I'll go out and find myself out in the middle of the desert. Of course, I bring plenty of water and, you know, provisions and things like that. Uh, but it's, when you get out into the middle of the desert and you're say five miles away from where you parked on a bike and the only way back is to, to ride through, you know, Rocky, <laughs> everything yeah. there wants yeah. to kill you because there's rattlers, there's cactus. Like if you fall off the bike in any direction, you're going to land in cactus. So, you know, I kind of put myself in a place where almost everything is out to kill me uh, or hurt me or, or put me in a bad position. And uh, you know, then it kind of makes everything else in life seem pretty mellow when, you know, you put yourself in that perspective of how small, you know, I'll put myself in that perspective of how small I really am. I'm just, you know, this evolved chimpanzee that's out in the middle of the desert, uh, you know, far away from, from civilization. And so I think that's one, you know, kind of physical way that I put myself into uncomfortable situations and then, you know, kind of mentally, and it sounds weird to say mentally, you know, pushing myself mentally, but like, having hard conversations, whatever those are, uh, early on in my career, I think I struggled a lot with having uncomfortable conversations or having direct conversations with prospects, managers, even family members, my spouse, everything else. 
So being able to, to put yourself in a position where you're able to have uncomfortable conversations and that it doesn't affect you uh, is key. And I'm trying to think of some examples of where I've really pushed myself there. I mean, if you listen to, you know, folks like Tim Ferriss or, or others out there, oh, yeah, yeah. they'll talk about like the coffee challenge. And I, I want to say I've done this before, which is if you're going to Starbucks or something, try to ask for 20% off on your coffee. Uh, it's a, <laughs> or he does stuff like go and lay down in a public place just in the middle of the road. I don't know if I'd recommend that, especially during a pandemic. Yeah, probably not. But I, I like the, I like the idea behind it at least. Yeah. Asking for discounts or, uh, like just pushing yourself to negotiate on things or barter on things. Once you do that a handful of times, it makes asking, you know, or pitching pricing to a prospect on the enterprise side, not that hard. Uh, especially if you back it all up, but you kind of just get exercise that muscle of being in an uncomfortable conversation and sort of mentally removing yourself from it and just letting it happen uh, and executing on it in a way that you don't look uncomfortable. Because if you go into a pricing conversation with an executive buyer and you're fidgeting in your chair and you're stuttering, it's not really going to convey a lot of confidence to that buyer that you know what you're talking about and that you're confident in the deal. So you know, if you can start by practicing that at Starbucks by asking for 20% off your, your latte, then you do that a few times and you're going to just build that muscle up of being able to sort of separate yourself from the situation and just have the conversation and accept the outcome and overcome any follow on objections. Right. So the barista at Starbucks might say like, Oh, we can't do that. And, you know, maybe a response back is how come, <laughs> you know, then you just yeah. kind of like learn how to be uh, a you put the ball in their court. Sure. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's mindfulness as well. You need to accept whatever you're feeling and then try to find the source of it. So if you're uncomfortable asking the barista at Starbucks, it's okay, why do I feel uncomfortable here? Like what's what's the worst possible thing that could happen? You know, I, I asked I asked myself that a lot when I was growing up and it yeah. uh I probably didn't have the right uh, framework. I didn't really think through a whole lot of things that I did, but I would say, am I going to die? No, I'll right. be fine. Right. And so there's, there's that side of it, but then there's also, I think the great thing with exploring limits is you can find those limits. Um, I, I disagree with someone like uh, David Goggins. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he's an animal. He's a, he's an amazing dude. A, a great person. Um, I just think there's also wisdom in acknowledging stress and acknowledging mm -hmm. limits and realizing that you need a break. Um, and again, it goes back to people and, and having people in your life that can tell you like, you need to take a step back because this is, changing you this is making you something different i've i've actually i was talking to a buddy the other day about applying a like exercise programming template to a uh to a sales quotas throughout the year so like if i'm training to lift it'll be you know three weeks increasing intensity and then the fourth week deload it's not going to be nothing but it's just going to be uh less stress on the body. Right. And so within a 12 month cycle, uh, if you have four training blocks or four quotas, and then within that three month period, you have your, you know, two months kind of going up and one month kind of coming down before you start your next cycle. So yeah. that doesn't brief well, if you know, you're trying to hustle and grind, but if you're planning on being in sales or doing anything for the rest of your life, I mean, it, there's working hard and then there's, there's working smart. There's kind of focusing your efforts. Like this is the time, Hey, it's July 4th. It's my wife's birthday. It's my son's whatever. I'm going to take this week and I'm, I'm going to kind of like put it on the calendar as to be a deload week. And I'm just going to focus awesome. on these things. Yeah. And that's one of the beauty. That's one of the nice things about sales is there's there's peaks and valleys. You know, there's going to be times where you have to really get extremely focused in on the task at hand. But there's other times when things are going well, deals are closing, and you can kind of I don't want to say withdraw, but you can step back a little bit and rest your mind uh, and your body and kind of recoup. Uh, so that's 
you know, I guess it's a both, both a pro and a con about the industry is, you know, pros is that like, if you're producing, uh, life can be pretty, you know, chill and unstressful, but if you're, you know, if you're not producing, you got to figure out how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Just being able to, to take a load off and relax a little bit. And it's, it's great in theory, but yeah, application, it's still super stressful. It's yeah. It's kind of like when you're hitting on somebody at a bar and (laughs) the desperate guy never, never gets any success. Right. Cause people can smell it. So, you know, um, yeah, I I think that might also apply here. Yeah. So where do you kind of see yourself in the next, I hate to ask like a, a typical job interview question on a podcast, but you know, where do you see sort of your career heading in the next five years? Are you gunning to, to kind of get from SDR to AE and then into leadership or you see yourself as sort of a, a long-term contributor just doing deals uh, or something different altogether? I know there's a lot of folks that start out in an SDR, a selling role, and then transition into operations or marketing or another kind of ancillary role. Uh, tell us kind of where you see your trajectory for the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, my plan has never uh, gone the way that I, I thought it would. I've, I've always planned one thing and then something else happens, which, you know, has been a fun ride. But um, yeah, I, I like focusing on what's immediately in front of me. I want to eventually graduate to the account executive level, but I'm again, reverting to my training and my processes. When I joined the army and I was a private and I hadn't been to ranger school and I didn't have any of those qualifications, my job was, you know, taking out some trash and sweeping floors and and doing those, the grunt work and learning by osmosis from those around me. So, um, yes, the, the AE role is where I see myself in five years, but I'm not focused on that. I'm focused on the people around me and building my processes and becoming, you know, the best possible SDR possible here in the short term. That's a good mindset. And I think if you do that, it'll happen before you know it. Um, and a lot of times, so, so I've worked with a lot of SDRs over the years and I've worked with a lot of reps over the years. Uh, I, I've met a lot of SDRs who were really antsy or impatient to get out of that SDR seat. And I was the opposite. I actually appreciated the time in, in the role because it, it allowed me to really master the, the pipeline generation side of the business. And once you can master that skill, you can really do anything. If you know how to make it rain software deals, then you're, you know, you're pretty set in, in this industry. And so a lot of people want to try to skip that chapter. They want to only do a couple months in that role and then skip ahead to the AE role just because there's I don't want to say there's a stigma around it, but there is, you know, a, a perception around being an SDR, but I think that I, I wouldn't have had it any other way. And the time that I spent in that SDR role was invaluable in teaching me how to, to really hone in on how to get, get a prospect's attention and how to, you know, master the phone call and the cold email and the cold LinkedIn and mail and getting creative with prospecting and selling value and, and boiling down an entire, pitch into a couple of sentences. Those are all really critical skills that if you don't invest the time up front, it might bite you a little bit later on. It might, you know, kind of handicap you in some ways that, that you don't intend. And so I always tell people like, you know, enjoy your time as an SDR. That's part of the journey. It shouldn't be something that you think is only going to last nine months or six months or 15 months or whatever it is. It lasts however long it lasts. And, you know, for some people it's longer than others, but every day that you're in that role, is an opportunity to learn how to improve that part of the craft, which I'm telling you from the AE chair is still the most critical skill in the business is developing new pipeline, opening new doors at new opportunities. And even if you're at a company like Zoom, where I imagine leads are just flying off the, you know, there's just leads coming in every single day for new companies. There's still an element of being able to go out and hunt for strategic deals and hunt for the right type type of companies that are going to help, you know, power your quota and things like that. So I say enjoy, man. And I, I love the mindset that, you know, you're not, you're not already thinking about how quickly you can get into the AE seat. You're thinking about, you know, what, what can I pick up from this role that's going to help enable my future success as an AE? Yeah. And um, I just wanted to say thank you for your show because it's been, it's been great listening to you and and the podcast that you've done with others and and trying to, you know, hone my craft as I transition into this role. So 
I really appreciate that. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. I've gotten a lot of great feedback. Uh, I've said this a lot. Like I didn't think too many people were going to tune in um, and I wasn't quite sure what direction I wanted to go with the show. And I knew I knew that there wasn't a lot of content out there for regular everyday contributors and sales. So I thought at the very least, I should just sort of document some of the stuff I'm doing. And, you know, selfishly, my other aim was I want to interview other top performers and people that have, you know, frameworks for how to manage mindset or how to be successful or how to overcome objections and things like that, because I'm still learning myself. So I wanted to have, uh, you know, this is a way for me to network and it's a way for me to meet new folks and build my network. Uh, but also I'm, I'm learning every episode I put out, I learned something. And uh, I'm glad to hear that, that others out there are finding value in, in the, 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 the content. So more to come, definitely a lot more guests to come, more topics to cover. Uh, my wife's telling me to be more open and talk about some of the more taboo topics in the industry. So stay tuned for some of those. She's right. I think there's a lot of topics in the industry that need to be addressed that not a lot of people are willing to talk about. Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to do it because, you know, it's important. So I'm glad, glad you're liking it, man. And, and I know we're, we're coming up here just about at time. We're actually, this is probably the longest episode I've ever done. So, um, you know, any, hey, I told you, I've got a master's degree in bullshitting, dude. <laughs> Any final thoughts you want to leave with, uh, with the audience here? Um, and then we can kind of wrap things up. No, nope, Just, uh, again, focus on people and processes and results come. And then I guess the second thing is, uh, become friends with people who are going to challenge you when you start to get comfortable. Love it. John, thanks so much, man, for coming out and being on the show. Uh, I think the audience is really going to love some of these uh, ideas and, and tactics that they can implement right away. Jesse, it's been great. Thanks.